I'm Miranda Cosgrove, and this is part one of my favorite episodes of Science Minute with Minute Earth, an illustrated segment from my show, Mission Unstoppable. Oh, wait, let me animate myself. If dragons were real, would they actually be able to fly? Or would they drag on the ground? Quick, to the mathateria! For an animal to fly, it needs the right combination of weight, wing size, and flight speed. Basically, the heavier an animal is, the bigger its wings need to be, or the faster it needs to fly in order to stay airborne. So, to determine whether dragons could realistically fly, we scoured movies, TV shows, and video games to try to figure out those traits for as many fire breathers as we could find. It was a lot of dragons. Here's what we learned. Not a single dragon would be able to get off the ground. They don't even come particularly close. In fact, the average dragon in our database would either need to fly 10 times faster or have wings 45 times larger if they wanted to stay aloft in the real world. And frankly, it's probably a good thing dragons aren't realistic. Can you imagine the pet food bill? Islands do strange things to animals. After moving to islands, big animals, like large mammals, tend to get smaller, while small animals, like many birds and reptiles, tend to get bigger. What in the Dr. Moreau is going on here? Scientists call this phenomenon the island rule, and it seems to work like this. Large animals, like this dwarf elephant's ancestors, might have shrunk after taking up island life because the islands tend to have less food than the mainland, and a smaller body needs less food to survive. But small animals, like this pigeon's ancestors, likely found that island life was generally free from predators, so they didn't need to be so nimble. Also, being bigger comes in handy when defending your stuff from your rivals. There could be other reasons why the island rule works, and there are some rare exceptions to the rule. That said, the pattern is pretty consistent, especially on small, remote, tropical islands. But just to make sure, I packed my bags for a tropical research trip. Let's just hope there aren't giant spiders. You know the well-known nursery rhyme of the three little pigs, right? This little piggy went to the market, this little piggy stayed home playing video games. Oh, is that not the version you know? It's based on the new study that pigs can play video games. Four pigs were recently studied. Oh, let me tell you their names to give them the credit they deserve. Hamlet, Omelette, Ebony, and Ivory. And they taught them to play a simple game that was originally designed for monkeys. The game involves moving a joystick around to hit targets on the screen. Since pigs don't have hands, they moved the joystick with their snouts. Of course, the scientists discovered that the pigs were pretty good at it. So when they beat each level, they got snacks as a reward which is how I like to be motivated as well. I get french fries after this, right? There are many things that sea slugs are not. They are not fluffy, they are not cuddly, they cannot do tricks, or can they? Scientists discovered two species of sea slugs that can do a death-defying stunt. These slugs can detach their heads from their bodies and regrow a new body from just their head. They do this to survive against parasite attacks. The slug heads can actually regrow all of their vital organs and even start eating again within hours. These slugs live to eat and eat to live. It's the algae that they consume that gives them the ability to survive this crazy feat. Scientists believe they regenerate their bodies using the energy created by the photosynthetic chloroplasts they harness from the algae. Because of this process, they've even been nicknamed the solar-powered sea slug. If you lose an arm, it's not coming back. That is, unless you're a rare salamander known as the axolotl. When they lose a limb, a blood clot stops the bleeding and skin grows over the gap. In humans, the same process leaves us with just a big old scar. But the axolotl is just getting started. The nerves that run to the severed limb trigger a bunch of unspecialized cells called a blastema from around its body to come to the area and start forming a mound. As the mound grows, the cells inside it begin to re-specialize, reforming complex tissues to make a new arm. This process doesn't just work for limbs. Axolotls can regenerate all sorts of stuff, even their brains. Scientists have been scouring the axolotl's genome in hopes of cracking the code to their regeneration secrets. If they can figure out how to grow replacement parts for humans, amputations and risky organ transplants could one day be a thing of the past. Thanks a lot, axolotl. Australia is full of wild animals with pouches, marsupials like kangaroos and koalas, but they also have the dingo, 
a pouchless wild dog that definitely doesn't seem to fit in, not only because it lacks a pouch, but because there's nothing else like it. There are no other dogs or wolves native to the continent, which makes the dingo quite a canine conundrum. So where did dingoes come from? Recently, scientists made a breakthrough. They compared DNA from wolves, dogs, and dingoes, and found that while domesticated dogs are descended from wild wolves, wild dingoes are actually descended from domesticated dogs. That's right. More than 7,000 years after humans first domesticated dogs, some of those dogs somehow ended up stranded in Australia. Researchers think that perhaps a small group of domesticated dingo ancestors might have arrived on a daring seafarer's boat from somewhere in Asia. However they got there, the dingoes quickly became wild again and spread throughout the country, into the outback and beyond, becoming the apex predator of their strange new homeland. The U.S. is surrounded by great white shark-infested waters. And it's all former President Richard Nixon's fault. Well, sort of. See, when Nixon was the president back in the early 1970s, he was worried that younger, more eco-conscious voters wouldn't support him in his re-election bid. So, in an attempt to sway that group to his side, he passed a bunch of environmental laws he would have otherwise opposed, including the Marine Mammal Protection Act, which meant that Nixon nixed the hunting of animals like seals and sea lions. As a result, over the last few decades, pinniped populations have boomed. Gray seals, for example, were once basically extinct on the Atlantic coast, and now there are tens of thousands of them. And the proliferation of those 800-pound butterballs has in turn caused a massive increase in the numbers of their main predators, great white sharks who are swarming popular beach areas in greater numbers than ever before. And it's all thanks to Nixon's presidential seal of approval. Animals all over the world cover themselves in spots that look like fake eyes. Butterflies, fish, and even frogs do it. The reason seems obvious at first. Big, unblinking eyes might trick a predator into believing they've been spotted, which would rule out a sneak attack. But do eye spots really work by mimicking eyes? Scientists aren't so sure. That's because there's also another hypothesis, that the spots instead freak out predators by being big and obvious, even if the markings look like a pair of big X's or something else not even remotely shaped like eyes. Both theories have been supported by experiments, which means that the dispute continues. And it's possible that eye spots work one way for some species and the other way for others. One thing we know for sure is that they work. Scientists in Botswana found that they could protect cows from lion attacks simply by painting googly eyes on the cow's butts. Now that's an optical illusion. Zombies exist. But fortunately for us, they're mostly ants. Down in the Amazon rainforest, a species of fungus is able to infect certain types of ants and hijack their muscles, effectively taking over the controls. That's scary enough. But then the fungus makes each infected ant crawl high up into a tree and hang out there until it becomes so bloated with the fungus that its head bursts and spills infectious spores down on the forest, infecting more ants and continuing the cycle of the walking dead. For now, there's no way that the fungus can infect humans, or any other mammals for that matter. Our body temperatures are high enough to kill it before it can do any damage. Ants, however, have lower body temps, so they're the perfect victims for a fungal jungle parasite. If you like this, there's a ton more to see on the Mission Unstoppable YouTube channel. Or if you're in the US, come watch the new season on Saturday mornings on CBS.